Okay, I started the recording. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, yeah, I guess I will just start. Uh. Okay, I think first of all, thank you everyone for attending today's meetup. And um, yeah, I think this is the first time we are doing this like mini series behind the gem. So um, to be honest, I'm not very sure what is the best format or content to share. So I think at the end of the session, the, some feedback of like what is good or what can be improved will be very helpful, especially for the subsequent speakers. Lah. Yeah. So yeah, so I think this is the over, overview for today's sharing, right? I'll share a bit about like myself, um, like no flare, some of the technical challenges we face, and then some of the technical choices that we make. And then at the end, we have a Q&A session. Lah. So I think first off to share what, what I do, right? I, I'm like I, I'm Adrian. I'm co-founder of like Noteflare. So uh, yeah, I think I write on the on the side, I also write engineering related posts on my blog. Like every I try to write every other week. Uh, so we ranging from things from like engineering management and like decisions to maybe more technical posts. So um disclaimer for whatever I'm gonna to share today is that um it's my personal opinion. Um it's accurate as of today. Um, there might be some better ways to approach certain things. So um, do let me know if there are better ways because I, I would love to learn from it also. And also, like, it might not work for your use cases. So, yep. So, I think to share a bit more, right? I think Noflare, I think like, like Kangsha mentioned, we are the Cat Career Salaries and Reviews platform. So, uh, we have uh, every month there's like 30,000 tech talents that comes to a platform to uh, to grow their careers, to research for new opportunities. Like within Singapore, there's just 15K. So um, there are multiple products that we have. Some of it is like recruiter, where like we help the talent through the interview process, jobs where it can be a job creator that's dedicated for ta talents. Salaries, where we help provide salaries information based on what users submitted and uh, insights where we give like insights into what the com like specs companies into the behind the scenes of like companies to statistic and uh, we also write blogs to to share about what um like hopefully some interesting content so i think you can see right there's a lot of products that we are actually juggling and uh, to be honest the team is is quite lean uh, most of the time uh, i think at max capacity is only uh, me doing full time with uh, one or two interns so i think throughout the blog i will sort of share like okay what are some like things that we do to um to help us move fast la, with the limited constraint. So uh, the test test one is, is very simple. For the back end, we use uh, Ruby on Rails, uh, front end, uh, we use a combination of uh, ERB and yet yeah, I will share more about this later. Uh, DB side or Postgres, Elasticsearch and Cloud, mostly everything um, use AWS. Yep. So I think I will share first of all, one of the first technical challenge that we I uh, uh like that we face la. So um I think when we build NoFest service, we want to provide salary information to users, right? So they can make like um like um like informed decisions. So what hopefully we're able to provide sort of a history of like what this company is posting about how much they are paying for these jobs and what actual employees are be, are reporting about their salaries. So if you look at it, actually there's a lot of source of information that is coming into this um that product. There's a user submission that we crop job listings from like other places, and there's also like if we job listing from Micro's Future, which is a, a Singapore-based like government-based uh, job portal. So there's multiple source of information, and in the future there might be more. But yeah, I think that's the that's the context. So I think. The issue with that, however, is that uh, because the data are from different sources, right? They have like different fields. So in order to do any form of computation to give like insightful salary data, um, we have to do some form of data manipulation and cleaning up. Yeah. So I think the initial thought uh, the the approach right, right, to, was to process the data on the, like, the code level and then cache the results. So some something like this. Um, but I think we very quickly realized that there's some issue with this approach, right? Which is that um, first of all, the salary class will become like very bloated. Like, like if you look at here, it's just three source of information and three attributes, and it's already rather bloated. 
I think the second thing is that because everything is processed on the server level, right? Uh, there's a performance bottleneck that we realize, especially with the as a number of the the data grow with time. And I think last of all is that it's no easy way to really um do any form of like query on this data set. Um, like it's it's not that easy to filter as compared to like uh, let's say the active record that you, those of you are used to. So very luckily, I came across this uh, Ruby gem that's called a uh, CINIT. So what it does is that uh, it allows us to create and manage database views in Rears. So the, on the left is like what it looks before. On the right is that um, how we use it is that we write sort of write a SQL um, query and then we run a migration and we're able to assess um, the class as it is. So if you if you get that take a look, right, the snippet of code is it's actually very straightforward. It's very short. So that's just one thing, right? I think the other benefit is that because this computation is done on the database um side, that that's like uh we see an improve in performance. Lah. Yep. Yeah, I think the second thing is that is that I feel I, it's one of the biggest benefits is that it acts like an active record model, is especially a huge lifesaver when you are doing computation because we are able to do um, like associations very easily like that all the has many belongs to or we're able to use uh, methods like where and scope to like filter out things and I think for us because we are using elastic search right like by putting into an active record model we are able to sort of integrate with like um, search kit which is an elastic search gem that we are using so things just comes along it like, comes together very smoothly and I think the last of all is that like in the we are able to sort of cache these um results very easily with uh, materialized views that comes with it. Um so I think this is especially useful when like um to reduce like any performance bottleneck or like to reduce a number of like calls to the database that you need. Uh, let's say in the, especially in the case where let's, let's say your data set don't really have a huge change in the um like data, you don't really need to like we query the whole view every every single time that like you're able to use this approach. So that's about it for uh, this Cine gem. gem. So um, I think it is very easy to use also. So it, yeah, I would recommend you all to have a look at it. Hmm. So next, right, I will tell about the less, I will say the less technical aspect of some which like tech, like talk about some of the technical decisions that we make. So I think like out there, that there's a lot of blog posts that talk about like um okay what is the by right engineering decisions like what is the like correct way of doing things right but i think as a, as a startup right like we are, we are two to three years old we are often faced with a lot of like resource constraints and like requirements like for example we have to make decisions and like build a build a product with very limited visibility on how the product will eventually evolve over time and so i think today what i will share here will be more of like what is the by left decisions that we deliberately take as a startup, which I, I, I don't really see a lot of like um, people writing about. So I think for us, right, we don't have a huge funding. Um, yeah, we didn't raise a huge funding. And like as private startup, we need to move fast. So I think it's always the mentality of like, okay, how can we like develop such that we are able to take over the market share from our competitors that's like we really 10x larger, right? But we, we have like, 100x less resources. <laughs> so I think all of our decisions are very cost conscious. So what this means is that um, like even when it comes to uh, engineering team size, it's only me and like one to two interns next at any time. And I think I always have to joke about it, right? That like people always say like, oh, they use a test-driven development. development. I think for us, it's, uh, we, we are interns-driven development. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so, but, um, but at the same time, we still need to go for speed, right? But I think there's also an element of like, oh, sh like we still have to ensure the code base, like health don't suffer terribly. So that, such that like three years down the road, like my future self don't start to curse, curse myself for all the decisions, terrible decisions that we made. So I think for us, when it comes to choosing the technologies or like how to approach building certain things, right? I think it's really about looking at engineering as a means to the end when solving problems. So what this means is that we prioritize using the easiest way to solve a problem over using like our fancy fancy technologies. Like. 
I think a lot of companies try to be cool or um, they try to incorporate like AI or whatever when it's not really necessary or like the impact is really like negligible. So uh, we, we try to not follow that footstep because I think that we really don't have the luxury as a startup. Yeah, so we also don't try to reinvent the wheels. So what this means is that we try to use all the available like gems and like libraries out there that does the job instead of like getting things from scratch. And I think the last point that's quite important is that uh, we tend to like put down our pride and like we embrace like no code plugins and tools. So what this means is like, I think previously I shared about like, um, oh, we, we use a mixture of like embedded Ruby and React for the front end. And I think the, the rationale is that, uh, I think personally, I always find that it's easier and faster to build when it comes to static components. And I think it comes with a lot of like uh, out of the box, like solutions, like the form helpers that comes with action view. And I think um, the last of all is able to assess the models directly, right? So I think for, for those who are familiar with like using like React on Rails, there's sort of a need to transform the data into a certain format before we can pass it into the React components. It's, it's not that difficult to be honest, but I think all this additional effort and complexity adds up over time. Now. And I think this time can be better spent somewhere else. So there is some examples of the things that we do. I think on the left-hand side, it's, sort of like, it's, it's one of the a screenshot of a job listing. Like as you can see, most of it is static. There's not much interactions. So the entirety, the entire thing is mostly built on like embedded Ruby. And I think on the right side, right, is um it's a typical thing that you see is like when, for example, you see a pop-up that shows when you try to exit a page that asks you to do some action. Um, so for that, we use a, a no code plugin called Elf site that allows us to implement all this like within 10 minutes. Lah. So I think the good things about it is that like we can customize like all these like things like oh how often to show this pop out when to show it, and I think maybe even the best part of it is that let's say we need to update the copyright copywriting or design right, it's it's really easy like even my product designer can go to the like, platform and just update it uh, without bothering the engineering team, so this really frees up uh bandwidth on the engineering team's um portion. Yeah, so I think the last part I want to touch on is that I think when it comes to our approach to choosing when to write tests, I think it's, it's um, like, I think for, not sure if everyone knows, I think for Facebook, when they first started, their motto is move fast and break things, right? But I think when, as the company scale larger and there's more users and engineers, things start to break a lot more often and like more time is spent on fixing bugs rather than like development. So subsequently, they change it to move fast with stable infrastructure. So I think the same like lessons can be found here, right? Is that like it's, it's clear that like the um investing in like writing tests and all these like practices has its benefits both in the short term and long term. But I think if you flip on the other side, I think from a startup perspective, it's like oh, if you write two liters tests, we will suffer in the long run because like we are going to move slow. Uh, but if we write too many tests right now, uh, we are also going to move slow. So because like, um, like this time has can be spent on something else, la. or rather like I can even um, I would say but argue that like, uh, because we are moving like we, uh, there's a lot of things that we have to test out. Like the products might not be in a very mature stage. There may be a lot of changes. So a lot of time that's spent on writing these tests might eventually be like thrown out of uh, the door. So I think the question really is that, oh, how, how much test should we write as a startup? And how to decide when you should write the test, right? So I think for, for me, uh, we, for us, I sort of use this unspoken rule to measure, which is the F my life complexity. La. So what, does it really, what it really means is that, like, I think when like, we think about, okay, should I write test? I think the question we ask is that, okay, how badly can this piece of code really screw up my day if it, it, if it screw up? And when you screw up, how tough is it to recover from like the worst case scenario? So for example, right, like let's say we have a patch operation that um, can potentially wipe out our database. Then for these cases, we will write tests. Yeah, it's worth the effort. But I think sometimes like, let's say we have a, like a instance method that's just a read-only method, then we might or might not write tests for such cases. Yeah. And I find that like this 
uh, rule kind of to me it makes sense even across industry because I think with the same mentality, you will probably write a lot of tests. Let's say if you are in the fintech uh, industry or you are in some other industry, right? Like there's really less room for errors. Yeah, so I think the second thing is that um, we also write tests where there are too many cases to test manually. So um, for us, we have this piece of code that uh, determines the seniority of a job listing that is being scraped, right? Based on like several uh, attributes like job title, years of experience. So I think there's probably 50 cases to test. And I think when you look at it, it's like, hey, it doesn't really make sense to like have to test all these 50 uh, cases manually wherever you make any changes. So in such cases, uh, test-driven development approach makes sense and it actually speed up development. Yep. So I think that's about it for my sharing. Um, yeah, I think you can open up the or questions if there's any uh. yeah okay uh, thanks like Adrian for like being so honest with his experience uh, anybody has any questions oh like yeah now, now is the Q&A session if you uh, if you like make business decision all these curious or technical decision stuff. Uh, feel free to ask, okay? Or, or if you are very, or, or you, if you don't like want to like say it out, uh, you can type it in the chat and, and I can read it out for you. Uh, so, yeah, so like Ted, Ted asked something. <laughs> so not Flare is actually real Flare. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the kind of true. Like, I think, the I think I think a lot of people always ask us like oh Node Flare like so you use uh, Node JS, um I think uh yeah. I think the origin of that is really I think if you go back to the origin of like when we start the company right like I think when you talk about it's like more of like okay how can we connect like like developers with like and other developers on like all like opportunities so Node is like the different points in the network and Flare is like helping them shine. So, but I think people always say, hey, hey your logo looks like a blockchain startup. <laughs> or are, are, you, are you using Node.js? <laughs> yeah, but the main part of it is Ruby on Rails on the back end. Uh. Yeah, actually, I also initially also thought that like, it's Node.js related when, when, uh, when you join the Ruby SG group. And then it's like, oh, actually not. <laughs> uh, okay. Then Ming Ting has a question. Uh, Adrian, can you share about some of the technical scaling challenges you have seen so far and how they were addressed? Yeah, so I think um, some of the technical scaling, to be honest, I think uh, like I think most of the technical scaling uh, issues is solved very frankly by um, like putting more resources in AWS, like scaling up the 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 compute com, compute resources lah. I think for us, we haven't reached a stage where like the code itself is the bottleneck. So yeah, I think it's from a business perspective, it's it's worth putting that like paying like ten percent or twenty percent more, uh, instead of like trying to spend time looking to the the whole like um like infrastructure lah. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, just scaling right on 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 AWS. Press some button on the UI to scale it up. Uh, okay, and then Ernest has a thanks question. again. Thanks. And Ernest has a question. Uh, Noteflare crawls job sites and pass them to easy to find. I guess like, uh, sort of like, I correct me if I'm wrong, Ernest. It's like you're asking that does NoFly do this thing, right? Just ah, yes. cons consolidating mm -hmm. all yes. the jobs yes. into mm -hmm. one portal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what we do. Um, because I think fundamentally when I look at it, like, I think we see right that there's like a lot of like solutions out there, like indeed, LinkedIn, all this. Mm -hmm. but, uh, a lot of times their features, all these are built more for a generic job portal that, that works really well across all kinds of jobs. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to the like, engineering jobs, let's say you want to search for a specific text that mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of them is not that accurate. So we thought that, hey, I think there's a 
really a room for us to build sort of a layer over it that um like help people uh find find their like filter for jobs more easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I follow I, so I follow up to that, right? So um is it um do you fetch it? Uh, I, it's not that I want the secret sauce or so, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So um the does a change in any of their websites affect you? Like in case they change the UI or anything, or are you fetching by maybe hooking it through an API that they have available, or is just crawling their website and then passing them as you deem fit? Which means that yeah. should any changes happen to any of their website, will they affect no flare? Uh yes, it will, but uh I think it depends on the source of data. So for example, from my career's future, right? We are sort of working with them. So we sort of have an API and the results are the, the results return is very clean. So uh, we just have to clean up further for our use case. Oh, okay. So is there a way in future maybe, I mean, because uh, let's face it, like the node flare idea is, is better because I rather prefer that there's one place I can get most of the jobs I want than actually go to Indeed, Glassdoor, and all that, right? So uh, with the hope that Nodeflare becomes big, do you have an idea of maybe talking to them and let them maybe create an API for you so that you can fetch from the various API points and you didn't have to care whether they change their UI or not that way? <laughs> do you have yeah. to plan something that? Yeah, so I think uh, in the long, I think that will be a... To be honest, I think on a business level, there will be probably not quite possible because it's kind of like a com- competitive competitive product, right? So mm-hmm. there's, I think there's really very little incentive for like all these commercial players. I think for Micro's future, because it's a government owned like platform, mm-hmm. so their job is really to help people uh, secure a job. Like there's not they are not profit driven. So mm-hmm. that, that makes sense. So I think the plan moving forward uh, is that eventually once we reach a certain scale, right, we will start to um, have like companies post job directly. So okay. you will sort of shift more from a aggregation model more to a, a job posting model. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. That sounds, that's more sustainable so that you'll not be dependent yeah. on any of these guys. In yeah. case you decide to, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry I'm bugging you questions, right? But then... Uh, uh, no Cynic, and is there a, is there a dramatic difference between I'm not that clear. Like, is there a clear difference between Cynic and then PG Search? Like, uh, or the, I don't know, but I'm just asking. Are they okay? Uh, I haven't really heard of PG Search, but I think I I can take a look at that. Yeah, I think it will be interesting, but I haven't really heard of that. Hmm. Uh, so it's just, uh, I think it's more like instead of using the, I think the idea is that instead of uh, relying on other search distance, and if your database is PostgreSQL, then PG search actually does the database search queries for you. So you wouldn't have to depend on any gem like uh, for search as far as your your database is Postgres. Mm. I mean, that is the idea, the fair idea I have about it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Can, can, do you know like is it possible to like query the like views all this like actual the active record ish way? Yeah, I think it's. It, I don't know. I don't think it's uh more active, but they they have provided an overlay for active record stuff. So as long as ah. your database is uh PG, they they have an overlay like a wrapper around it, whereby you can actually call your search multiple times, depending. Then you define your you sort of like, depending on the model you are using, you can define the search queries with the RGM. But I don't know, they don't provide views to the best of my life. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I think for us, the views portion makes, is, is, is makes more sense. Like, and I think for us, I, I personally really like the Cine part where like you can use all the active record methods. Yeah. So the, the, I think for, especially for any like newcomers that join the, the learning curve is a lot like less steep. Yeah. I think I personally have not heard it before until you say you 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 said it. I think I'll take a look at it. So um so how are you making money? <laughs> are you making money and what is the plan? Because I think it's a very good uh it's a good thing. It's quite convenient. I checked it out and I could just go anywhere and get so are you making money? What's the plan? 
Yeah, thank, thank you for your kind, kind words. I think uh, for now, the revenue model is more on, like, on NoFlare Recruiter, which works more similarly to a like, recruitment agency mm-hmm. where uh, we, we have clients that are looking for talents and then we help them source for these talents. Mm-hmm. So um, then we, we charge company on that. So it's, yeah, but I think in the, in the, in the long run, I think with like more users, it makes more sense to charge companies uh, based on like premium job listing or like, yeah, I, I, other stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think there's a question from Ted as well. Uh, yes. So the question from Ted is, do you rematerialize the view every time a new salary is written? Yeah, so for for me, right, for us, right, um, we don't really rematerialize that often. I think uh, we are still at a stage where, okay, because from the information, we, we sort of scrape the job listing on a sort of like daily um, like frequency and the number of salary is not, I wouldn't say it's, like there, there's assumptions it's not coming like every other like minutes so for now uh, we, we don't really uh, materialize it yeah but I think uh, if we were to do it it's probably such that like we do a scheduler to materialize it like every hour or so hmm. uh, actually I have, I have a question also just now you mentioned that uh, that you, you guys use some sort of tool to to manage copy, right? That even oh, yeah. your, the product people can uh, can do it. Is that yeah. like a, a, a paid service or something? Uh, okay, so for example, if you look at, I think this is the one that you're referring to, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think if you look at this model, this like pop-up, right? It, like I think all this copywriting is managed on the platform side. Lah. So like this platform allows us to um, create like configure all these um, things that we want so be it can be adding a button can be adding a mod, like pop up or even things like um, like displaying like your social media stuff so there's a lot of like widgets that comes with it this is just one of it so what it does is that we just configure it then we just plug the code uh, plug the like, JS code into the our code so any changes we just update from there yeah. Ah, I see. So it's like a no no code uh yeah. kind of like UI builder thingy. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, think- th- thanks. That very interesting. <laughs> okay, uh LinkedIn has a question. How does Noteflare handle stale data? Example salaries posting may change over time and duplicate data. Yeah, I think for the s- for the okay, so I think for us for the salaries product, right? Um, if we if we take a look here, right, there's actually from multiple source la. So I think for us, um, job posting is a secondary source of information. Like we always sort of trust what actual employees are saying, because like companies can say they are going to pay how much, but end of the day, what are, what are people actually receiving? I think that's the more accurate source of data. So we will prioritize that. I guess the usefulness of the data from the like, actual submission. So I think over time, um, like to be honest, um, like right now we we haven't really thought about that yet. Because uh, how to handle like the stale data from salary? Because I think this product is soft. If I'm not wrong, it's only launched for two to three months. Um, we are there's other things that we are fixing. Yeah, but I think in the long run, where there there enough sufficient data probably makes sense to do sort of uh, uh, like give a scoring based on how recent the data is, etc. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not very sure what, what is the best way also. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, okay. Anybody has any other questions? Um. Okay, then if not, I think like uh this is good. Uh yeah, so I there's like a lot of interesting questions like asked. So like thank you, Adrian, for being so like 
forthcoming with uh, like some questions are like business stuff, right? And then uh, and then some are like technical stuff. So yeah, so thank you for being so forthcoming. Yeah, and okay, I will stop the recording first.